Welcome to the Manga Bay Newscast. It's October 19th, 2022, and I'm your host, Mike Gorecki. Excited to be back from my three-month hiatus and bringing you the news and inspiration from nature's front line. Today we discuss the blue heart of Europe, the pristine, wild rivers of the Balkan Peninsula, which are ecological wonders and biodiversity hotspots. But there are plans for large-scale damming of the rivers to produce hydropower. We take a look at the impacts those development projects would have and the efforts that are underway to stop the damming of Balkans rivers. Our guest is Ulrich Eichelmann, an ecologist and conservationist who has spent the past three decades working to protect and restore Europe's rivers. Eichelmann is the founder and CEO of Vienna, Austria-based NGO Riverwatch, as well as the coordinator of the Save the Blue Heart of Europe campaign an initiative that aims to better understand the incredible variety of life that depends on the rivers of the Balkan Peninsula and to protect those rivers from being dammed. Here's Eichelmann with more on his background and the campaign to save the Blue Heart of Europe. I'm a, a river activist and river protector as long as I can remember myself. I started even in the, as a kid. And I worked for numerous organizations and always protecting rivers. Mostly it was a work and campaigns against hydropower plants. And in 2012, we started the project in those days of the uh, saving the Balkan rivers. And we were uh, the German NGO Euronatur and us. And it, it started pretty small, but it became then a campaign. And it has now turned into a movement that is really sp- you know, gaining momentum every day. So that's nice to see. Now that when when I was working on, even in Austria for WWF Austria, we all knew that the rivers on the Balkans are something extraordinary within the European context. But we didn't know for sure, you know, we just knew it basically. And then we decided together with Euronatur and some other friends, hey, let's have a deeper look. And that was actually in 2011. And then we assessed the quality, the intact, the integrity of the Balkan rivers scientifically. That was one thing. And there we had evidence how incredibly intact and alive these rivers still are. So they just survived the decades of destructions in this area of ex-Yugoslavia and Albania and some other countries. So they survived that. And and we were astonished that is this kind of river still exist in, in Europe. The other thing what we did, and that was a game changer, was we assessed all hydropower projects in the region. So we decided within the campaign at an early stage, we wanted to make the, pro- the beauty and the problem visible. The beauty was with the intactness, the hydromorphological maps we created, and the the bad side, the dark side were the dams, and we assessed all projects, all dams under construction, and all operating plants uh, for the whole region. So we decided not to focus on certain rivers, we decided not to focus on certain countries, but on the whole region. That was a new approach. And the outcome, the result was this map with all these dots, the red ones for those who are on the, in the planning phase, the yellow ones who are on the construction and the black ones operating. That was a game changer because we suddenly saw, you know, there are thousands being planned, thousands. And literally every single stream or river was foreseen to be dammed or diverted. And that map, that visual made a difference because even people who think or believe that hydro is a good thing came to us and said, hey, this is too much. That's too much. I mean, this is like you want to destroy every single stretch. So that was for me a very crucial moment to have this beauty and the beast approach and to make it visible. What is at stake and what is the real situation and that is threatening it? And that's how it all started. Can you tell us a little more detail about what makes the rivers of the Balkans so special, what their importance is to Europe, what biodiversity they harbor, what they mean to local communities? On the first hand, 
you know, I am a river person. I know a lot of rivers in mostly in Europe, but, but also in the US, South America, Asia. But I was not aware that this diversity and this beauty is still existing in our old continent because our rivers in the rest of Europe, because of all these thousand years of tradition, we have destroyed almost most of them. And they, the rivers on the Balkans are very diverse. So you have the full variety of different river types. You have big rivers with big floodplain forests. You have crystal clear mountainous streams. You have wild rivers with huge gravel banks and islands and stuff. And you have waterfalls that I didn't even know that they exist. When you see the photos, you think it's somewhere deep in the Amazon. Uh, but it's, it's, it's in the middle of Europe. So the, the variety of rivers is astonishing. And I would say the beauty that comes along with it. So that is long forgotten in other places, how rivers actually look like. We, we, what we know here is channelized rivers and dammed rivers and completely deteriorated and, and altered river stretches. So people grow up with things. They believe it's a river, but it's not. And going to the Balkans, you suddenly see, wow, how beautiful is that? Now that is, I think it's a very important issue beside all the facts about biodiversity. And, you know, when you come to hydro about megawatt hours, all this technical stuff, it is a story about beauty and the beast. It's so beautiful. What we did On the other side was we asked scientists to assess the fish biodiversity and the diversity of mollusks in the region. And the outcome proved what we thought. It's an amazing, an amazing diverse area for fish especially. So it might be the highest density of trout species in the world in comparison to the size of the area. There's a lot of different trout species, as well as many other fish species that are endemic. That means that they live only in the Balkans and nowhere else. So that, is, that was breathtaking. On the other hand, we asked the scientists then, okay, can you assume, can you think what, what happens to the fish species if all these dam plans would become reality? And the outcome is that about... 49 to 50 uh, fish species would go globally extinct or would be pushed close to the brink of extinction. And that equals about 10% of all European freshwater fish species. So that's enormous. So the, th the threat is an enormous loss of biodiversity under the umbrella of the so-called green energy. You know, they, they're say, telling us that we need to build more dams in order to fight also biodiversity loss through climate change. But the, the reality is completely different. They're speeding up the destruction of nature and the loss of species, you know, in the name of fighting uh, global warming. And we see that a lot. And that's why we're fighting so hard against the dams in the campaign. We have kind of, it would, I would say, no compromise attitude. So we are not talking about can we mitigate some of the projects or can we build them a bit better, better fish letters or bypasses? No, we know that, and every, every scientist know that, every dam does its harm. And in the end, if you look at on a global or at least let's say European scale, We have so many hydropower plants and so many dams in our continent that this, this is not a question whether we want hydropower or not. We have it. We have 23,000 registered hydropower plants in Europe. But the question is more, are we willing to leave some rivers in our continent free flowing or not? And that is the, the answer from us is yes, we want them to keep free, free flowing. And that's why we fight every single dam. It's like With everything, you know, with the medicine, if you have, if you, t if the doses is limited, it might be healthy for you. If the doses is too strong, you die. And and this is the hydropower doses for the rivers is is in most region already toxic, 
and on the Balkans is not yet there. And that's what we are, you know, we are fighting for that. That is that still the blue heart keeps beating. Uh, you've touched on this a bit already, but can you tell us what is the scale of the hydropower development proposed for the Balkans and how many of these projects are still in the planning stages versus how many have been completed or at least begun construction? So every two years, we assess the dams on the Balkans again. So it's an update. And the, the last update was done just a few weeks ago and was presented. So on the whole Balkans, that means between Slovenia and Greece, and that's an area, just to let you know, um, it's about 80,000 kilometers of rivers and streams. That's the river net we're talking about. And in this region, there is about 3,400 hydropower plants projected. About 100 are under construction right now. And about 1,500 1, um, 1, around that are operating. So the operating is not if you if you look to other countries that's not a big it's not a big number but you know when 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 the rest would become operational that would be the end of the whole river network so there's and most of these hydropower projects are so called small scale hydropower plants with an installed capacity less than 10 megawatt and all the experts agree that they make more harm than benefit, you know, because when you when you think about small, it might sound beautiful, but it's really a disaster. What they are planning is cascades of dams along the little rivers and diverting the water away from the river and put it into pipes. And the pipes direct the water to generators and then generate electricity. Others different than to other European countries like Austria, where I live in, these river valleys are very remote, very natural. Uh, so there is very often no road towards into the valley. So in order to build a hydropower plant, you, you need to build, you need to construct roads, tunnels, bridges, transmission lines. You have to cut the forest. They often bulldoze the trees just away without anything. Uh, so the harm to nature is enormous and much bigger than just for the river itself. Very often, illegal logging comes along with hydropower development because it's like in the, in the Brazilian Amazon, when you build roads, you improve the, you know, the access. And then suddenly trucks come and they cut down the forest as well. So we're fighting for much more than for just for the rivers, for the intactness of the area. From what you've seen in your travels and your work throughout the Balkans, how do the people there feel about these plans to dam so many of the rivers? We are fighting with and for the people who live there. Different than here in Austria, I'd say the people in the Balkans are very much living with nature. Maybe that's maybe that's because they're fairly poor still, but they love their rivers. They live with it. So they go swimming in the river. They fish. They, you know take the water for irrigation, for their gardens. And they just, you know, the rivers flow through their village. They just like it. There's almost for every bigger river or medium-sized river is, for example, a particular song. You know, it's deeply, deeply rooted also in the culture of the people. There is there is books uh, with the Nobel Prize winner in Serbia about the Drina. That it's all about rivers. So it's very deep and the people are connected. And they don't want their rivers to be destroyed. And, and we're helping them. And that's, um, that's for me actually wonderful because it's kind of replenishing my accus, my accumulators or my giving back me energy. Because, you know, when you fight against the rivers, you sometimes here, you would have the feeling you're, you're fighting against windmills or something, uh, against something that is senseless. But on the Balkans, I just love it how the people, you know, are not misused in a way that they say, oh, OK, uh, let them build the dams to fight global warming. So in other words, let them destroy nature to fight global warming. No, they care about their environment. They care about their nature, about the river. And they that is very inspiring for me when I'm there. 
and I'm often, very often in the region, no matter where, if you, we're in Bosnia and Serbia, in Albania, or last weekend there was in Kosovo, it's always the same. The people are asking us for help and they're very, you know, dedicated and passionate. And that's, that's very, you know, gives me a lot of hope also for the, for the, the battles. And that's for sure one of the major issues, the activists on the ground. The other is scientists. We, we learned that we know less about the biodiversity and the, how rivers work, actually, in the Balkans than we know about Rio Negro, for example. So about most of the river, nothing is known about the, what lives there in the water mostly. And uh, so we created in the first phase the scientists for the Vyosa River. The Vyosa is this big wild river in Albania, uh, which is likely to, uh, to become Europe's first wild river national park early next year. And then we developed it further to a project called, we call it uh, Scientists for Balkan Rivers. And they, we, we're, you know, we're trying to connect as many as scientists as, as possible. And we have, for example, every two months, a, a webinar where sometimes up to 100 scientists join. Um, and there's a lot of people from outside the Balkans also with their knowledge and their capacities and that where can we help? Can we assess something? And we try to direct them to rivers and river stretches that, that are under attack and where their um, help would be needed the most. And the second pillar for the scientists for Balkan rivers is the so-called Science Week. Ah, yeah, I know you've done a few of these Science Weeks, and they sound like they're really, really cool. Can you tell us what a Science Week is and how they've factored into the campaign to save the Blue Heart of Europe? It is a week where many scientists come together at one spot and then assess the different groups of species, whether this is plant or, or animals. And the last one was in Bosnia in, in, late, in late June uh, this year on the Neretva River, a wonderful, incredibly and astonishing, beautiful river. And we spent uh, there 60 scientists and 30 other people, including journalists, lawyers, activists and locals. There were 90 in total and we spent one week mostly in tents. And every morning, you know, after breakfast, the different group went to certain sites to assess what they had to assess. So there were the fish group, there was a large mammal group, there was a, a macrozo, bentoso, uh, water, insects in the water group, bat, a bat group, what, you know, hundreds, <laughs> many, many groups. And they went out and came back in the evening and uh, told us what they what they found. And their data uh, from this whole week um, is is being collected and pr and there will be a report early next year, will the final report ready be ready. And then we send it to the authorities uh, in Bosnia, Herzegovina, um, to give them, to show them what is at stake because the Neretva River is probably the most, the river in Europe that is under hydro attack the most. There are 70 hydropower plants projected in the area and two or three are under construction. So and we try to save as much of the river as we can and stop as many as we can. And the scientists are, you know, their findings help, uh, help us and they speak out by themselves. So they do press conferences, they do, you know, lobby uh, activities, they go to Bosnia and present it. That is something that we're really pushing for, that every that's group in the Blue Heart becomes a stakeholder by themselves. Normally, when you hire scientists, they do their work, they produce a study, they give it to you, and then they say, so here is, the job is done, do what you want to do. And then when you're an NGO, a, national, a nature conservation organization, you would then make a press release with it. And you say, this scientist did this study and, you know, the outcome is this. Okay. In this way, it's only, it's always the NGOs representatives that speak, but in the blue heart, it's the scientists that speak up. We, we do also speak up, but in a different, you know, different way. So it's, 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 it's different partners there. Uh, and the same is with the lawyers. We have a group established. I think we have 10 or 11 legal experts hired 
uh, throughout the whole Balkans. And they are trying to stop the dams on the legal level. You know, they, they, they file lawsuits or complaints or whatever is necessary. And the findings of the scientists is ammunition for them. So it all works works together. You know? And then beside the scientists for the Balkan rivers, the lawyers for rivers, we have also artists for Balkan rivers. So we have a lot of musicians, painters, cartoonists that really help us. Last, no, the two weeks ago, we had a three-day gigs for from very known Balkan, Balkan white known artists, musicians, Darko Rundek from Croatia. He was two, three days traveling uh, with us uh, to certain rivers and play music at the rivers to give people and the rivers a voice. And then the end was a big concert. So there's a lot of different ingredients of a campaign that we try to make a different campaign than the usual recipe, you know, we try to do uh, things different and try to make it bigger and better actually every day. So the next one of the next concept project might be cooking for Balkan rivers because uh, there's uh, some chefs, the cuisine, who um, I had a meeting with and they, I, I had the feeling that it's, it's wonderful because you can sing about the beauty of the Balkan rivers. You can assess the biodiversity as when you're when you're a scientist you can write lawsuits when you're a lawyer but you can also eat the diversity and cook the diversity so there is another bubble if you like a group of people uh, that want to translate the importance of protecting the rivers into their language in this way it could be cooking uh, cooking or eating it and then you would you would reach out to different journalists again so and so on and and that is from a strategical point of view that was our approach so making the first thing was making the problem visible with these maps the hydromorphological map and the dam map and then how do you then the question was how do you stop three and a half thousand dam projects that's in principle an, an insane approach because you know try to stop one damn project that's difficult but so many it's weird but the the, the strategies we, we we use is 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 working and beside these tools that i mentioned we have partner organizations in the region so we have we're financing certain NGOs in Albania, in Serbia, in Bosnia, in Northern Macedonia, and now in Kosovo, that we work intensely with and we develop the things together. And uh, these partners are the ones on the, on the national level. And then very often we have working relationships with activists at the sites. So local, very local. And this mix of local, national and international is is the trick i think so that is that has proven to be very successful and i don't know the numbers but we have stopped or halted in the last five years i would say several hundred projects and the era of these small scale dams uh is 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 about to be over and the small scale dams are about 90 percent of these three and a half thousand projects so that's a very substantial number. I'd love to hear more about the findings of one of these rapid biological surveys that y'all are doing, these science weeks, as you call them. I know, for instance, that, as you mentioned, the first one was on the Viosa River in 2017. What are some of the highlights of what the scientists found in that survey? Well, in the, in the beginning of the Viosa, we only knew that this is probably the most unbelievable river in, in Europe. Because when I saw that river, I, you know, and I consider myself a person that knows a lot of rivers. And I thought I know every, almost every river in Europe, but that was crazy to see things like that. And the, the Osa, for those who certainly don't know it, it is a river that comes from Greece and then runs 200 kilometers through Albania into the Adriatic Sea, in the Mediterranean Sea. And there is no artificial obstacle in that river so it's completely free flowing and it's the river it's the architect of the valley so it's really wide in some in certain areas is one and a half miles wide 
and it's just gravel bars and, and oxbows and things like it's really dynamic river and then it enters the sea and the what is also wonderful about this river is that they're, they're the tributaries the rivers that flow into the Viosa are also intact and pre-flowing most of them so and that is actually the incredible uniqueness of, in Europe that you have a river system that is free-flowing and intact so that not only this one river in length but also the you know the the river the network and that is what we learn from there what is actually a river so that why a lot of interesting people including scientists and also journalists and other interested people go there to, you know it's probably the only option in at least in central and southern europe to see a real river to understand what is a river because we give a name to the rhine or the danube or the mississippi or whatever you like But that's just us. Uh, and and, and the, the actual Viosa in this case is also the tributaries. Even the tributaries of the tributaries of the Viosa are part of the Viosa. And what you when you harm the smallest one, you in the end harm the big one as well. So this is this is the value of the Viosa. And the question was, how can we save this uniqueness? And there were eight dams planned in the Viosa itself and more than 30 on its tributaries. And one of the thing is we said, okay, we need the court. We need the legal uh, people here. So we hired lawyers, but we need information. We need data. So we brought especially a scientist from Austria there, colleagues of mine. And then we went to, from the universities here, we went to Albania. There were uh, colleagues from Tirana, Uh, university as well. And in the end, we started the first science week. We spent four to five days on one four kilometer uh, spot of the Viosa and they caught whatever they could catch. You know, like just go there and whatever you catch. And in this four or five days, they found 40 species new to Albania and two species new to science. It was a spider species and a stonefly. So there are no, you know, they're the Latin name is not like Isoperla Viosa. So they're named after the river. And that's only in four or five days on a four, four kilometer stretch. And uh, ever since, and this was published then. And um, also that the scientists went there. Uh, there was a second science week and then more student groups went there from Germany, from Austria, from, from Albania. And bit by bit, We are trying to better understand the whole, the whole river. And it was published in books. And then there were lots, the scientists did a lot of also um, media work. They did, for example, on the first science week, they presented the results on an extra or in a press conference, but on, in an extraordinary location in the middle of the river on a gravel island. So each and every one had to go there by boat by a raft, actually. So we brought the journalists there and then the scientists announced what they found because it is an unusual, it was like an unusual activity to visualize the, the uniqueness of the whole system and what is at stake. And then uh, this, the science community itself got more and more interested in this. And one of the reasons was that a lot of university professors are fed up with the system in the universities because what you what you often need is money for your work for to doing research and where do you, do you get the money from the public money towards the university is is being reduced and reduced so they found they try to find additional money from private companies to finance their work and this money is very often from coming from companies that want to destroy nature in the end so here for example The universities of Vienna, they get the money, for example, for to assess the river biodiversity on rivers in Ethiopia. They doing that as a preparation in the framework of an EIA, of an environmental impact assessment for a hydropower plant. This is, imp this is very often completely devastating to your own mindset. And that was the case for many scientists. I know they said, hey, we're, we're not doing the right things anymore and we're get, getting paid for it, but we don't feel well, very well. And so in this respect, 
um, the work on the Viosa, we couldn't pay them. All we ever pay is like, for example, travel costs and then accommodation and food when they're there. But when they're a week there and they're high ranked professors, they don't, you know, that's in their free time. And the most of the work, as you probably know, is <laughs> comes later when you, ass when you assess all the animals that you have and write reports and publish it. So it's a lot of work. But they're doing this because they're real researchers and because they want to help. They understand that if you want to change something, you have to do something different than, than you did before. And so they become a voice and they became a very strong voice for the Viosa. Um, and they went to politicians, they spoke to the, uh, the public and they became actually a, an important stakeholder. And when the government was ke kept pushing for building dams, they were an important part, I would say, that in the end, the government said, okay, no dams and we, we will um, establish a national park instead. That was a very important uh, tool. And then, you know, from then on, we said, this is too good. The whole system of this, in those days, was scientists for Viosa River. But this is a too good idea to let it go. Uh, we, we, so we established this group, uh, scientists for Balkan Rivers. What we did also, another element, and it's an important element, is we established the Viosa Research Center. So we rented a house next to the Viosa River in Albania and uh, put beds and material in there. And that is now a research center um, where students can sleep in, where scientists have a base. Whenever you go there, you can stay there. You have the, the, the microscopes and everything. Um, and you're just right next to the river. And this is also an important thing to show to the local communities and to the government. You're not, you're not talk, just talking, but you're doing something on the ground that is visible. It's kind of leaving traces. You leave traces and we need a guy who takes care of the house and to so on. And just last weekend, the um, environmental minister of Albania and the parliamentarians of the country visited the research center and made photos and on social media that would have been two years ago unimaginable for us because we did it as part of the campaign and saying hey, we're doing this for the for the scientists and you know we want that the local communities they can come here and <laughs> see and smell us uh, what is scientists what are they doing and explain and now it's it's an important i think it's important even for the government that is there they learn their things and One more, one more aspect that I see from the scientists is that they really want to know what is a river and how do rivers work or how did they actually work? Because in our continent as well in the US, but we're, you know, we're so much longer deteriorating rivers. It is very difficult to understand how rivers originally functioned because we had dams that hundreds and hundreds of years ago influence the flow of sediments, for example, and so on and so on. And on the Viosa, you have suddenly the, the opportunity, you know, you, do, you, you go backwards in time, uh, like Scotty, beam me up, you know, but beam me back, backwards, and to assess how it was. And that is so important, you know, and that's, I see the scientists becoming also child, children again, you know, with their eyes, because suddenly they see, wow, look at this, how, I don't know, how the, the, the size of the gravel stones, you know, how they, uh, the, the compilation, how does it look like? Um, and why is that so? You know, all these questions, how many sediments are being transported to the sea and what does it in the sea or the nutrients that come? And what are the fish? How are they connected? And wh what do the fish do in an environment without barriers when global warming is hitting them? So how far up go the fish to find a proper, appropriate, cold environment for them? All the things like that. So this is so important for the, in this particular case of the Viosa, but there's also other rivers uh, in the Balkans left where, where it's the same, like the Neretva I mentioned earlier. It's incredible. And in the Neretva, for example, you have pristine forest, pristine forest, beach forest from the rim of the mountains to the, to the river. And that combination of old growth forest 
and an intact river is, I don't know, it's completely, I think it's completely unique. And we don't have, have that on the Viosa anymore because of the, of um, centuries of, of sheep and grazing and shepherds and goats. But in the Neretva, it's still, it's still there. And for example, in this last science week in June, it was very hot. Although it's about, I don't know, 700 meters uh, above sea level. So not too low, but it was hot. And, uh, but the, the scientist found an amazing, an amazing amount of especially insects. And they told me it's only because of the forest, because the, the, the insects live usually along the, the waterways, but it's too hot for them. And the heat is also stressful for them. So they can escape into the, into the forest and relax. With, when we would lock the forest and leave the river free flowing, you know, we, we would certainly damage uh, it, it enormously. And just an example, one professor from Austria, he found in, he, he caught in one night, in one place, 100,000 caddies flies. <laughs> that, that is so unbelievable much. It's unimaginable even. When you, when you would do that here, you would probably catch 400. And that is also the, the, the issue is, is, how did rivers look like, actually? How was it? You know, we have the, the, the stories of old fishermen said, oh, the film, the, the, the river was full of fish and stuff. Yeah. Okay, these are old stories, but we can have a look. We can see it here. Uh, maybe not so much with fish because people are fishing, but the insects and everything else. That's that's amazing, and that's motivating, inspiring. And then, when the locals see that these foreigners are coming, and they're they're happy, they at the beginning I think they I think they don't understand it. What what you're doing here? But in the end, it's always the same. When we are coming and we say it's so great what you have, you have these rivers, and we we we, we love your environment, and we try to help. They're, they're, they're having tears in their eyes because they're so happy that somebody comes and respects them and, and loves their area, their, their homeland, actually. Uh, and that opens the heart and the doors very fast. And you have a drink, a lot of alcohol, Rocky or whatever. But that's another issue of the Blue Heart campaign. If you know the Balkans, Most people would think about, oh, the war, you know, ex-Yugoslavian war and ethnical conflicts and poor people. And now these days, refugee routes. Uh, so negative connotations. But we, our story and, and our convincing part is, you know, you have something wonderful that no one else has in Europe anymore and that they feel respected. And they feel, you know, if you were, if you would be an ordinary person living in a village in the Balkans, you hear that every day that that you are not you you are not modern, and uh, you know people ah, in Germany they they think oh the Balkans are poor people blah blah, but suddenly foreigners are coming and and you know saying how great it is what they have. It is as I said, it's about beauty, love, and respect. Well, just to wrap up our conversation here, can you tell us a bit about what your organization's vision is for Europe's rivers now and into the future? Oof, the, the future looks grim, to be honest, because, uh, you know, now there's the hydropower lobby is still strong and they it looks like they will never give up bef until they have dammed the very last stretch. Uh, another threat that is coming is um, dams for other reservoirs for irrigation, you know, following the, the, the hotter climate. Uh, but the, the hope is there that the hope comes from the Balkans for whole Europe. I see that. And uh, they inspire a lot of other people to increase the fight, to improve their fight for the rivers in Europe. I do think that especially in the east of Europe, Or southeast, where the Balkans are, and the east, there's still rivers in in very good shape with enormous biodiversity, and there the goal is to to avoid any kind of destruction. Whether this is uh, channelization for navigation routes or dam building or building reservoirs for irrigation, that's the 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 
the most important part. On the other areas, like in Central Europe or in Western Europe, this restoration, the, the biggest important. So there, there is dam removal, so removing dams also, but classical river restoration as well. well. So get the rivers out of their artificial embankments, out of their corset, uh, and let them, you know, have the natural dynamic to the right and to the left. That is very, very important. And the European Union and with the government of the European Union, the European Commission, uh, they have a clear, they have this um, Green Deal. And within this Green Deal policy, there is the biodiversity strategy. And within this biodiversity strategy, they have the goal to have restored 25,000 kilometers of rivers and streams until 2030. So in eight years from now, they they want that the member states uh, will restore rivers uh, in, in this enormous length. 30,000 kilometers is a lot when you see what has been achieved in the last 20, 30 years. You know, that that seems impossible. And we need to use that, uh, these goals, these political goals, to, to get better also on the NGO community side to fight for bigger and better things. So I can overlook three to four decades of uh, nature conservation work on the ground. And there were periods when we really dared to think big, you know, to fight big projects, to ask huge uh, protection sites. But over the years... It changed. So over the years, we became more satisfied and faster satisfied with small things. It seems like we're um, marginalizing our efforts while the rest, the economy, is is thinking global and bigger and bigger every day. So, you know, all these projects are huge. And then nature conservation is, is you know, is, is, is fighting for trees even. Which is which is okay, but uh, learn again from the Balkans and learn from the Vyosa, for example. So if we're, it's hopefully the case that uh, also with the help of uh, Patagonia, for example, we will have Europe's first wild river national park by the beginning of next year that protects three to five hundred kilometers of rivers and streams in one park, and. And, and it might be extended to the Greek side. And then we are talking about 700 kilometers of waterways that are protected in a national park. We, the, the beginning of this was years, a decade ago, and it was that we dared to think we want to protect it all. We are not, we, we could have easily said, oh, let's protect only the middle section with the big islands and stuff. No, it was like, we, and it was unrealistic to be honest, in those days. It was completely, and most of the people thought we were, we were nuts, but it wasn't. So it, it needs these big dreams and, and you need to dare to think big. And that is the message that comes from the Balkans. Believe it, dare to think it, dare to think it. It's the first step. And that is a message to my colleagues and all of us in the rest of Europe, I think that we need. So we're, we're, we're satisfied with little things and say, okay, but... Maybe it's a good start when we start with this little step and maybe next generation can do better. I am afraid if we if we continue to thinking like that, there will be hardly anything left to fight for. If you enjoy the Mangabe Newscast, we ask that you please help spread the word by telling a friend. That's the best way to help expand our reach and keep the show growing. Another way to help is by becoming a monthly sponsor via our Patreon page at patreon.com slash manga bay. We are a nonprofit news outlet, so just a dollar or more per month would really help us with offsetting production costs and hosting fees. So if you're a fan of our audio reports from Nature's Frontline, please head to patreon.com slash manga bay to learn more and support the Manga Bay Newscast. You and your friend can join the listeners who've downloaded the Manga Bay Newscast nearly a half a million times by subscribing to this podcast wherever you get your podcast from. Or you can download our app for Apple and Android devices. Just search either app store for the Manga Bay Newscast app to gain fingertip access to all of our new shows and all of our previous episodes. And of course, you can read all of our news and inspiration from Nature's Frontline at mangabay.com. 
Or if you prefer to keep up with us on social media, follow us at facebook.com slash manga bay or on Twitter and Instagram. Our handle is at manga bay on both those platforms. Thanks as always for listening to the Manga Bay Newscast. I'm your host, Mike Gorecki, signing off. Talk to you again in two weeks.